Sure. Turn around and look this way. Hey, thank you for being here. Oh, Welcome to Aspen. Yeah. Welcome to Microsoft. Everything else. I saw the email you just sent out talking about being the platform company, the productivity company of the mobile first and cloud first world. That's either a brilliant statement or a great collection of buzzwords that I don't understand. So let's unpack it. The productivity company, what does that mean? Does that mean you're getting out of devices? You know, it, the, the core conviction that I started even my job with is that the unique value that Microsoft can add uh, in a mobile-first, cloud-first world is around productivity and platforms. I mean, that's the core of who we are. That's the sensibility we have. And I strongly believe that that sensibility has got to be redefined, reimagined, and changed. Uh, but it's very relevant even in this mobile-first, cloud-first world. So, and in fact, we've been executing on it. I mean, if you look at one of the first things, uh, at least, that happened in my tenure was the launch of um, the most ubiquitous productivity service that we have with Office 365 for the iPad. Uh, but it's, that was one part of that day. In fact, we launched even all of our end user infrastructure for all devices. Uh, so that was another thing that we did. Uh, we launched a bunch of our data platform infrastructure so that we can infuse into organizations a data culture. Uh, we also launched a tablet that can be a laptop, which is the Surface Pro 3, which is all about you know, really defining productivity uh, for a mobile workforce. So that's really what gets me to think about productivity broadly as something that we can uniquely do in this highly changing, evolving world of mobile first, cloud first. Well, you use the word productivity, I think, 20 times in that uh, memo. Productivity is a word I use when I go to the office, when I talk about enterprise. But as a home consumer, I don't think the word product, in fact, I have never used the word productivity at home, ever. Yeah. Does that mean you're getting out of the home consumer space? Not at all. In fact, in fact, that's probably one of the big ironies, because in some sense, productivity to me is the most secular category, both in our life uh, generally, and then at work for sure. But you know, even if you think about it, it's at, at the economy level, we should be talking about productivity. Mm -hmm. We should be talking about it at an individual level. I mean, the best way to conceptualize it is take the time we spend outside of work. Uh, can I get more out of every moment of my life? Uh, and do I need tools and services and devices that can help me? Uh, one of the things that you know, late in life I uh, learned was to cook. And one of the things that I'm often doing is whenever I see some recipe, most of the times I'm sort of running into these things in uh, newspapers, still in print or in what have you. Uh, and one of the things that I do is I just take a photograph of it. We have this tool called the Office Lens, which takes that and OCRs it, and in fact does a beautiful job of snapping it, re recognizes all the text, and makes it searchable. Now that's productivity, uh, not for my life, not at work. Uh, I have, we have this intelligent agent called Cortana. I'm all the time setting myself reminders uh, for what to do on geofence. Okay, when I go to this you know, customer or when I go to uh, home, what should I remember to make sure I actually get done that day with my kids or what have you? And so it, as soon as I get home, it reminds me that these are the things that you should actually do at home. So these are things that are far outside of work. Right, and you say a platform company Unpack that for me. What's a platform company versus a services and device company? The, the notion that everything we do has to be a platform for someone else to build on, I would say is the core of how we built our company over the 39 years. And we need to do that and do that now even more broadly. So I mean, how is Office going to be a platform? I'll give I you a good on. example. Take the contacts in exchange. Perhaps one of the most useful platforms for me individually. I mean, without that now, I would be lost. It's available now as a set of APIs for every application everywhere to be able to tap into. Uh, so the, take the identity system that allows me to now, in a friction-free way, log in to the 18 SaaS applications I may use on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. That's available as a platform. Uh, of course, we have Windows as a platform, which has a shell, which is extensible. We can write universal Windows applications. We have a very rich cloud platform uh, for anyone to build applications. But I think of the data, your personal data, inside of the tools like Office, 
exposed as services for developers, provided as administrative tools for IT, are also platforms. And that's a sensibility that you need to have when you build even applications. All right, and you say uh, mobile first world. Uh, how does that affect, say, Office? To me, we need to start thinking about Office much more broadly than just a collection of quote unquote off applications. It's not about just spreadsheets or uh, Word documents um, or even email. Uh, take Cortana. Uh, the intelligent agent that we have on our phones. To me, that's the, you know, the redefinition of productivity mm -hmm. because that agent now has the ability on my behalf to get after all of my personal information, in fact, spanning both my work as well as my life. Uh, so for example, I mean, one of the scenarios I think about is, uh, say I'm a salesperson. Right, the canonical example of a mobile executive. I walk into a sales meeting and I'm walking out. Uh, this agent knows that who, where you are because it knows how to get after this, uh, you know, go to the exchange calendar and look exactly which customers I visited, brings up my CRM application as I'm walking out and lets me fill in the pipeline information. Uh, and then tells me, look, I need to pick up my kids at a, you know, a soccer game, and by the way, take this better route versus getting stuck in traffic. That entirety of, quote unquote, making more sense out of all my data, my needs, my tasks, and helping me. To me, that's the future of Office. It's not just one application, but the digital information that spans all activity is what Office is all about. Now, what about uh, being cloud first? Explain to me, as you walk around a year from now, your devices, everything you're going to use, how will that change because you're making it a cloud-first company? See, the cloud transition, I mean, Microsoft, we've, I would say we have a lot of work to do still as we navigate this mobile-first world uh, in the sense that uh, we were 90% of the PC share, we are around 14% of the total device share. So we get that, which is, uh, you know, we are still 300 million units of PCs and we're growing uh, in our tablets and uh, phones, but at the same time, uh, we're coming in uh, from behind on that. Whereas cloud, we have transitioned very successfully. Uh, if you look at the business, we'll talk, if we have our earnings in a week's time or so, we'll have uh, more news to share. But the transition of our infrastructure business with uh, the move to Azure, very successful. The transition of our office server business to Office 365, very, very successful. Uh, so from that perspective, my goal with our cloud is to make sure that we, our cloud and our cloud applications are pretty much available on every device in the world. In fact, the way we want to measure ourselves is the home screens of all devices, Android, iOS, and Windows Phone, should have Microsoft Cloud applications, though these are Office applications, and in many cases using our cloud infrastructure with Azure, uh, starting with even the end user infrastructure. Will I ever get away from having to need devices and it'll be more ubiquitous for me? I do believe that the phase that we are entering, or one could say we have entered, is clearly the centricity or the power, the, the need for coordination is shifting from device to the cloud. Uh, it's a cloud orchestrated world. Uh, devices are still going to be relevant and important because I at the same, at the end of the day, will use them. But even the definition of you know, devices, they're going to be large screens, they're going to be wearables, they're going to be sensors. So there's going to be ubiquitous computing and there's going to be this notion of ambient intelligence across experiences that span all this computing. Uh, and all that will get orchestrated by the cloud. The power of the cloud, the fact that all the state across all of these devices will roam, uh, and that I'm not installing things across multiple of my devices, they just show up, they'll identify me. All that's possible because of the cloud. So what are you doing in wearable? You know, we have ambitions to make sure, and we have demonstrated, uh, that when we think about Windows, we want to think about it as a pretty broad platform, uh, from wearables 
uh, to a lot of industrial IoT, in our, in, you know, Internet of Things scenarios, uh, to obviously the big screens, the PCs, the phones, and tablets. Uh, so you'll see us uh, make moves to make sure that we have, in fact, if there is anything that will define Windows, uh, is I think of our cloud, first of all, being living in a heterogeneous device world. It's not going to be limited to Windows. I think that's perhaps one of the big pivotal changes in our strategy, which is we absolutely think of building services and infrastructure in our cloud that'll be you know, uh, across Android, iOS, and Windows. And we will differentiate our Windows family because we've created you, you know, the user experience that's consistent across all of this, uh, how one can in fact start something in maybe a wearable and complete it on a phone, a tablet, a large screen. That's the ability to have multi-device scenarios which are increasingly becoming relevant. Those are the things that will differentiate it. A moment ago, you started a sentence by saying, if I were to define what Windows, and then you backtracked and went off, Explain to me what Windows will be in three or four years. Windows for us will always be uh, the device experience. Um, we will, in fact, also have first party hardware capability, which we have now with the Nokia acquisition, in particular so that we can set pace, we can create categories like the Surface One. Um, and our hope is to bring these experiences around f productivity uh, from the small screen to the large screen. And the uniqueness of Windows will be the developer experience consistency, the user experience consistency, and the IT experience consistency. That's another thing that I think that from a platform perspective, we think about it, which is we don't over-index on just one constituent. Uh, we've not got it wrong many times. Uh, you know, Paul was at Microsoft, and one of the things that I think we did well when we were at our best was have that strong notion of platforms where we were able to bring developers, IT, and end users together to create the magic. And that, I think, will always be a strength of Windows. Uh, how does Bing fit in, especially in terms of giving you data on your customers? The more important thing for us has been that Bing has taught us so much about what it means to build cloud infrastructure. I mean, if you look at where Azure came from, even the machine management. When you have a million machines, uh, it's not like a cluster. You know, it's not as if you're in the server operating system business. You don't naturally say, let me just put up a million machines and manage them. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we were in search, we were in Xbox Live, we were in Office 365, our own first party, quote unquote, footprint mm -hmm. allowed us to learn how to build a cloud infrastructure and a cloud operating system. And that, perhaps more so than anything else, has been Bing's contribution. Now, if you look at tools that are part of Office, uh, we have a tool called uh, Power Q&A. It's basically a way for me to ask natural language questions and get results from data. Uh, all of that, the query understanding part, is very much something that we learned in search. Uh, but now we're applying it to broad productivity scenarios in the enterprise. Uh, we have another tool uh, called Dwell, which actually is a pretty cool uh, discovery tool which allows me to see, for example, what presentations are being presented to my directs. Or like say you were working in our organization, I can just go to your profile and see all the things that you are presenting and people who are presenting to you. So this notion of thinking about office documents, not as isolated documents in some file store, but as a graph uh, that you can reason on. Uh, those are the kinds of things that I would say Bing has given us in terms of machine learning. In fact, one of the other services we just recently launched is an Azure service for machine learning. Uh, now, that's being used all over the industrial internet uh, in its preview form for doing predictive analytics. So a lot of what we've learned in Bing we want to translate it into broad use productivity services in Office or as infrastructure services in Azure. You know, uh, about 20 years ago, I went to Microsoft and there was a speech recognition group. And it was called Rec a Nice Beach. Because whenever you said recognize speech, it would think you said Rec a Nice Beach. <laughs> uh, and we're always 20 years away from ambient and, and ubiquitous computing. Do you think we are, in the next five or 10 years, going to get to the point where we have such a natural interface, we can yeah. just chat and... It's stunning what has happened. I mean, it's, it's also the unreasonableness, I guess, of large amounts of data being available, because it's not as if the algorithms themselves have suddenly become uh, very different than what we started with. And there are different statistical 
uh, means perhaps and approaches we have become smarter at, but it's just the sheer amount of data. I mean, here is a fascinating thing. The speech recognition software improvement that we have had uh, because of Kinect has been huge because the acoustic models uh, and the speech models, the combination of the two, it's not just daisy chaining them, but you've really got to build a deep neural net that understands that applied now to the phone, applied now to the tablet, makes it possible for me to make speech much more of a modality of interface, right? So now I speak a lot more, especially with Cortana, than I ever have. You and I were bemoaning the fact you wanted a keyboard on your phone. Uh, but speech has truly... I'm not your focus group. Yeah, I know. But, but speech, yeah, sure. you, you know, will get, can get you hooked on, which is now you would suddenly, once you start, because of the recognition and the speed. How will that change things? I think, for one, it's more natural, some of these things. Uh, when I can see something and it actually uh, you know, recognizes that I'm looking at that object, when I can speak to it, uh, when I can gesture and move things, uh, it just is a much more personal, natural interface. But will, we, I mean, but will I even need devices? I mean, I walk into a room, I, it might just have a little a uh, microphone and know everything I need and I in won't fact, have to have devices. I mean, think about it. Today, when I walk into my living room, my Xbox recognizes me. Sometimes it's kind of a little you know, scary in the sense that I go there and I just say, hi, Satya, and so yeah. on. Um, the thing that we are at that point, right, where you can, in fact, have, walk into a room and be recognized. In our conference room, we have this uh, device called the Perspective Pixel Device, or PPI, which is basically a large screen Windows device. Now, where we are going with that is, say, a conf you know, we have a conference and five people show up. We want to be able to recognize all the five people. We know who you are. We log you in automatically. We create a whiteboard. You can now go in, and when you start writing, it recognizes who is writing. And then when you're done, we can annotate everything and send you back. But that means you don't even need a traditional interface, like a Windows interface. Or Windows, as we know of it, has to change. I okay. mean. Think about what is really running on the Xbox now. It is Windows. What is running on my phone is Windows. But is it the Windows that we booted up on our PCs 10 years ago, five years ago? No. My own thing is, you know, some brands should be enduring because they have value, but every line of code should be changed every five years. Uh, so as long as we can do that, uh, then you can renew brands. You keep talking about the Xbox. That was made sort of by a little outside different type of group, right? What did you learn from that, and are you going to do that more? You know, in, one of the things I reflected a lot is, uh, I think there were some good comments made by, you know, Paul and others, but look, large companies have to have a core, uh, especially during times of inflection like this. Um, that's one of the fundamental reasons why I even wrote the memo to galvanize of, and focus our pe team uh, on the core of what we can do in a mobile first, cloud first world. That doesn't mean, so we're going to be definitely about productivity and platforms. And you can say, well, Xbox isn't that far from it. Uh, I can go on and on and list the 10 things in our platforms or in our apps that we learn because of Xbox, but we're not in the Xbox business for just learning for productivity or platform. We're in the Xbox business because we have a group of people who are passionate about games. We have one of the most enduring brands with Xbox. Uh, and we want to compete in there. I think large companies, successful large companies, which have, you know, when you have $27 billion of uh, pre-tax income, we can do a few more things than the core. Uh, but I think the point is you've got to have a culture to do it and not confuse it or restrain it. You can't take gaming studios and try and operate them uh, like an operating systems group. So we want to be able to get that right. And that's one of the reasons why I want us to be comfortable talking, being proud of Xbox, giving it the air cover of Microsoft to go innovate, uh, but at the same time, uh, not conflate it with our core. But might you have sort of little outside skunk works teams like that try to invent new things we, and disrupt things? How do you stay innovative? We have to, um, in the sense that there are two sides to your question. One is you do need to have places where you're incubating things. Mm -hmm. You also need renewal in the core. When I think about our challenge today and what I would claim is our you know, core priority is the renewal of the, the mainstream work. Uh, so notion that, look, let's take what we, were, we are good at in productivity and platforms, uh, but rethink it. 
that's not a side project. Right. That is the very company itself. That but said, innovating from the core is a rather new concept. That's right. Point. You have to. And there are times when you have to. My last question before we go to the audience. You're a poet. You love poetry. <laughs> you quote poetry all the time. Reminds me a bit of Ada Lovelace, who was a great poet who then yep, becomes the right. first producer of algorithms. Why the poetry? What does that give you? You know, one of my first managers at Microsoft, I remember on a flight trip with him, um, I brought you know, 15 magazines, nothing against Fortune or anyone else, and then I was going to read them all. And then the guy brings out James Joyce. And, uh, and then I look at him and he says, what the heck are you doing? And he says, look, you know, this is the way to renew yourself. Um, and I've, like, I've always loved literature. I've always loved poetry. And so that's how I get my inspiration. And I now I'm springing it, on, springing it on people, and so far, so good. And someday, I'm sure, I'll get blasted for and, what you uh, And do you read any current poets or the new poetry you've been looking? I must say, I have not. I just go back to the ones that I love. Which ones do you love? I mean, T.S. Eliot is just my all-time favorite. But in, in truth, uh, the thing that I'm haunted by is not English language poetry, my, is Urdu poetry. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and the 19th century Urdu poetry, there's nothing like it. In fact, uh, I wish uh, you know, there is more of that. Uh, but I do love uh, the, you know, the English romantics. I do love uh, the Americans. Well, you can't do better than T.S. Eliot. Right. By the way, T.S. Eliot has the great line that's about innovating from the core, that's right. which is, we shall not cease from that's exploration, right. but the end of all of our exploring we'll shall arrive be returned to the place started. where we started and that's know right. it for the first time. Let's turn out the lights, up the lights. And yes. Hi, Sacha. Chris Freilich from First Round Capital. Uh, I work with a lot of early stage startup tech companies. And Microsoft seems less and less relevant to them. Have you thought about how to, how to reach out to them more specifically? Yeah, I mean, one of the, it's kind of a, two sets of things. There's a bit of a selection bias and a perception issue which we have to break through. And one of the things that, uh, First place where I want to break through is with the cloud and the enterprise focus. Because even the Azure growth, unlike AWS growth, has come not on the back of startups, but it has come on the back of enterprise adoption. But that said, uh, any startup, even you can be on AWS even. In fact, one of the reasons why I want to construct our APIs and services is so that it's not an all or nothing. Uh, you can just use Azure AD and do single sign-on with Office 365. That's a benefit for any one of your portfolio companies. It removes friction from an IT adoption perspective. You can use our Cloud ML to do advanced predictive uh, analytics. You can still be on uh, any other cloud provider. So we need to get a better uh, at being able to create those value props and then enticing uh, developers. Uh, but we can you know, use a lot of help from you folks. And the other sort of misconception is that um, uh, we're only a .NET Windows shop. It's not. I mean, Azure in particular has got around 15 20% all Linux. Um, and so we will support pretty much every platform. You can bring any image. Um, uh, and that's something that we got to tell more boldly. And that's definitely something that's top priority for us. Yep, I, said, I see you in the way back. Is that? Yeah. Hi, Seth. Great discussion. I'm Vino Shivari with Home Life Tech. Coming from the biotech side of technology, my question is, uh, Wait, could you stand up? I'm yeah. having a little trouble, or I'm having trouble hearing you. Hi, uh, I'm Vinay Shwari with Home Life Tech. Uh, coming from the biotech side of technology, my question is on the application of cloud-based big data in the pharmaceutical space. Uh, as you know, this industry has started generating a significant amount of raw personalized data, both for patients and doctors. And I wonder if Microsoft is moving into this space as well. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the core challenges of uh, applying the cloud to big data is where does the data originate? Uh, so if the data is originating in the cloud, it's so much more easier for you to be able to then operate on that cloud. And then the challenge, of course, is all about privacy and pro provenance of data and so on. Those are all solvable problems, and, uh, and there are certifications and, and so on and so forth that one goes through, and we are very much in there. In fact, there's a lot of research that is happening now in the cloud just because people have started with their data sets there. Uh, but when it comes to the core of ph you know, the pharma business or the core of drug discovery, uh, it's a question of where is the data and can you get the data? Is it economical even for you to be able to bring the data to the cloud? 
And to me, that's one of the reasons why, and also, by the way, no one knows where the regulatory environment is going to end up. Uh, today's regulatory environment is not going to be tomorrow's, especially you take Europe and you take China and you take the world and the geopolitics uh, into account. And so when you say that, then you have to have a public cloud, which at scale, which is definitely something we're very committed to. Uh, but one of the things I do believe which differen will differentiate us uh, for all time is our server business. In fact, our servers are just basically edges of our cloud and they're replicas of our cloud. Uh, so we will have private cloud and uh, hybrid cloud support so that you have flexibility of where you want to operate on the data because people are not going to move petabytes of data. People are going wherever the petabytes of data are generated will be where they are and they will want elastic compute there. And that's what we need to be able to provide. Miguel Hell from Fortune. Uh, Satya, Microsoft has a fantastic research organization, one of the largest in the industry. Um, yet much of its work goes unheralded. We don't hear about it. Uh, I'm sure some things have become useful, but you look at the Google approach, and which is very different. Um, you're doing these crazy projects, moonshots, um, and, and now with the advanced technology group run by a former DARPA head. Is there something to be learned from the Google approach that's getting so much buzz, so much interest uh, in the world? You know, look, always good to learn from others who have done a better job of marketing themselves. Uh, the, the, the thing that I would say, you know, I, I say it in fact in not in, I mean, I think there is really, there's a lot of learning there. The thing that I would say is having this, in, you know, industrial lab, it's just a fantastic, I mean, Microsoft Research as a brand, the talent there, it's just unparalleled, it's amazing. And one of the core value propositions of it is that it's a research lab first and foremost. Uh, and that helped us attract the talent. That is really the contract between somebody who joins us and wants to be there. So we want to be careful uh, of not mimicking someone else who's got a different contract, maybe a successful one. Um, and so one thing though, I want us to celebrate some of these tech transfers. They're, it's at an all-time high. In fact, I was just you know, auditing it recently. Uh, take some of the in-memory technology now in our, in our database. Uh, that all came out of Microsoft. I mean, our database business is like a $6 billion business growing at a fast rate. All that's benefited because of some fundamental uh, innovation in in-memory that came out of research. The Skype Translate project, which I'm really in love with, which is the ability for us to take Three disparate technologies, in fact, speech recognition, speech synthesis, and machine translation. Complete outgrowth of what uh, Microsoft Research has done. And now we will be able to solve one of those oldest human problems about communications uh, between, you know, with language barriers being completely taken out. But your point is well taken. I want more of that impact. Whether we will do it exactly the way Google did it, probably not, just because I think we will have to invent our own of how do we get more mainstream impact of the innovations of MSR. Uh, it's not as if you're not benefiting today, but we can definitely do more. Right there, shout it out, or? Uh, uh, Hi, Dave Morgan from Simul Media. It sounds like you know, you're really looking at doing things differently than may have been done in the past in Microsoft and opening up culture and a lot of things. Can you imagine part of innovating from the core might be rather than holding everything in tight, the, the future Microsoft might be spinning things out and innovation might find, I mean, whether spinning out businesses, spinning out products, letting them be untethered from Microsoft to have a bigger impact in the market? I mean, the and, and since this is our last question, just talk about all sorts of new ways you could innovate based on that. Yeah, no, I think, look, I think the fundamental, I mean, you can go on and on about sort of strategy change, and we all know, as Peter Drucker said, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch. And uh, so unless and until we really, really change culturally, no renewal happens. And so I'm very much focused on it. And the first thing, for example, one of the things that I'm very excited about is Microsoft always used to hold code bases. Each team had their code base. They protected it. They managed their dependencies and so on. No more. I want all of Microsoft's code to be a shared asset. You can own a scenario. You know, we want to have internal open source. 
Uh, we also want to uh, uh, definitely contribute to external open source. I mean, even open source and our ability to sort of contribute fundamentally to Hadoop, use Hadoop, propagate more growth for Hadoop, those are things that are culturally very different for us. But we are well into it. It's not new. But we want to be able to embrace some of these things boldly. Uh, but it's not just in the core of what I would call um, the attitude, but it's even the way we work. And if anything, the nature of work itself, you know, if, if you're as successful as us, you got to have the ability to throw out all of that. Because you think about it, all of us know what a developer at Microsoft does, what a product manager at Microsoft does. But guess what? Maybe it's time has come for us to reinvent what they do, in spite of the fact that we've been successful. And those are the things that we are boldly going to question and change. Satya Nadelli, thank you very much. Thank for you being so here. much. It's a real pleasure. Real pleasure. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.